Yeah. Okay, everybody, welcome to another webinar of Point Distributions. Today, our guest is Matteo Souza of the Ludwigs Maximilians University in Munich, and he will be talking about the uncertainty principles, interpolation formulas, and packing problems. So, please, Matteo, the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Damir, for the nice introduction. Uh, so, first of all, I think I I have to congratulate the organizers for putting up this uh, nice series of webinars. I haven't been able to attend any of them so far, but I have seen some of the videos that you guys kindly recorded for everyone. Uh, I had some timing issues, but now that I'm back in Germany, these time zone problems will stop and I, I, I will start to follow what's happening here. Uh, okay, so I chose this title uh, because I come from harmonic analysis, not from, not from like point distribution and discrete geometry problems. I would say. Uh, so this talk will have like a little a bit of the connections between these uh, three, three, three objects here, the uncertainty principles, interpolation formula, and, and packing problems. Uh, so for those of you who are, who are interested in seeing like more details about what I'm going to talk about, uh, this presentation is going to be based on the following two papers. Uh, they're both available in archive. Uh, one of them is from last year, I think October. And the other one is from like two months ago. And they are both joint work with uh, João Pedro Ramos, who is right now at IMPA in Brazil, but soon moving to, to Switzerland uh, for a postdoc at ETH. So there's most, most of the results I'm going to talk about are included in these two papers, either the historical details or the, or the actual new results that I, that I did together with João. And since this, is a, this has a large uh, this has a crown that has like different interests in, in a way. I'm gonna not go too much into details during this, but we can discuss it after the talk if you guys wish. But perhaps there will be some white lies in to simplify some details somewhere. So be aware that some events may be changed for dramatic effect. Okay. Uh, and just so we we are clear, from now on until the end of the time of this presentation at least, this is the normalization we're using for the Fourier transform. Okay. So it's, uh, it's, it has this minus two pi i here. The minus is not so important for this talk. It could be plus, uh, but the two pi is very, very important. Otherwise, some results are gonna, are gonna change. Okay, so there are three topics in the title. The first one, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go from last to, to first. So by packing problems, I just mean some things you guys are very familiar with, and I imagine there were like a couple of seminars on this, on this topic before, before my seminar. And in a way, in a very vague and, and, and sort of high level definition, by packing problems, it just means you try to fit a certain shape inside a bigger space. And you want to minimize some loss. It can be surface area of, what you are, of the shapes you are using, or it can be the volume of what you are missing. Uh, uh, this is like a very general definition, but uh, in this talk, we're going to be mainly using the sphere packing problem, it's the more traditional ones. Uh, which probably precedes mathematics as a science, I would say. Like, I think people have been trying to, to pack objects like this before mathematics was even formalized, uh, like had formalized its first field theorems. Uh, the second object is interpolation formulas. So in a very generic way, I'm just, I just mean, like sometimes you have a space of functions, which is nice enough. So you can determine every function just by sampling it over small sets, like by subsets of the domain of the function. So the simplest example you can think of is if I have a polynomial of degree n plus one, sorry, of degree n, and you have n plus one points of the domain, then you can, you can determine the polynomial completely. So this is what I mean by interpolation, just finding functions uh, by knowing its values over a uh, small sample. And last but not least, uh, what I mean by uncertainty is just, Situations where you, if you know too precisely different measurements about a certain object, uh, the only conclusion is that that object has to be very simple, okay? The, the, the standard example for this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We all learned in high school, I guess, uh, that if you, if, you can, if you can calculate the momentum of a, of a particle very well and its position as well, then the particle has to be <laughs> kind of, non-existence, no way, or 
or alternatively, uh, if you have, if you you cannot precise the momentum and the position uh, too well at the same time. There's a, this has a translation to, uh, in terms of full here transform. So it just means that if you give me a function L2 and, and you know, and you can, if you can precise that the mass of the function is, is, is around a certain point, you cannot find a point that has the same property for the full here transform. Okay. Okay. So moving on. Uh, so, by the way, I'm not going to define what is the sphere packing uh, problem here because I'm sure you guys heard about it uh, several times and I, and I don't want to go too much into that. But what I want to talk about is this uh, nice Conan Elkins and Gorbachev bounds. Uh, so this, uh, the theorem I'm stating here, in, in a certain way, was first found by Gorbachev and then like two or three years later, Conan Elkins uh, restated this and they mentioned in their paper that uh, that you could you could derive this from what Gorbachev had done before, but he was interested in a different direction than they were. Uh, but let me state it in in a way that maybe is not precisely what is done in, in either <laughs> in either of these papers, but it's going to be useful for me. Which is the following: so if you give me a function in R D, which is real, and it's of uh, of Schwartz regularity, by that I mean it's infinity, and and every derivative is bounded. And its full head transform is also uh, satisfies the same properties. Uh, and you give me a radius, a r, a positive scalar, such that f satisfies the following properties. It is one at zero. It has integral one. And for every x, f of x is, is non-negative. And for every u bigger than r, f hat of u is non is non-positive. Okay, so it's a function that is positive is non-negative. But its Fourier transform starts it starts at one, but eventually change sign and doesn't come back again. Okay. And if you can find a function that satisfies these properties, then this R, the last sign change, uh, you, you, if you input it in this value here, the volume of the ball of of the, of the dimensional ball of radius R over two, this will give you an upper bound for the sphere packing density uh, in R D. Okay. So every every sphere packing uh, Every sphere packing that you give in RD will have density smaller than this number, volume of the ball of, of radius R virtue. Okay, so this is a, this, this theorem is, is, the theorem itself is not impressive. I mean, the proof of this is very simple. It's just a, a smart application of the Poisson summation formula. It's like a few lines. Uh, but the, the, the proof, the, when you look in the proof and you try to find the conditions to actually get the, an equality uh, in, the, in this bounds, then you, you start looking for questions which have very deep, uh, have very deep meaning, let's say. But what was most, was, was most important about this, uh, this, this, this bound was perhaps the, the work of Conan Elkis, because they used this, uh, this theorem uh, to produce new bounds for this feedback problem. So here I have the, the graph of what happened when they introduced this in 2002. So in red, uh, these were the best lower bounds that were known at the time. And in green, you had the upper bound that was produced by coin and by using this, uh, this theorem. So what they did were they, they produced these properties by just multi essentially multiplying Gaussians by uh, well-chosen polynomials, okay? And they tested this numerically up to dimension 40, let's say, or 50 something. I forgot the exact dimension where they stopped. And in blue, you have the best known packing bounds uh, for, this, for the dimensions that are mentioned here. And you can see that dimension 8 and 24, are the green lines and the blue lines are very close. And they are, in fact, they are very, very, very close. So if you divide the value that you get here uh, on the green line by the value on the blue line, they, they are almost 1. So the difference is like a 10 to the minus 8. I forgot long, but it's... it's this is essentially a, a numerical proof that in dimensions 8 and 24, uh, this, this, this theorem should give you the, uh, the sphere packing density. OK, so let's move on. Why is it not moving on? For some reason, my page is not moving.
is it an issue with the share or an issue with the um, like actual uh, PDF? Hello. Hello. I believe it's disconnected right now. So. Okay. Let me see if the chat works. Sorry, folks. Okay, so do you guys see me? Because I... Yes, we see Okay, you. now you're moving again. I'm moving again now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you and, and see you moving now. But now, my, but for some reason, my... My slides and are, are my slides moving? Uh, no. No. Try restarting the share. But now my so my my zoom is completely frozen. But, uh, oh. Yeah, I hear you guys, but for some reason. Okay. That is so, somewhat weird. Let me try something here. Sorry, everybody. Please uh, <laughs> hang on for a minute while we, while we figure this out. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck is happening. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Later we can. What is happening? Can you hear me, Matos? Maybe try to log out and come back, man. Uh, this the same thing happened some days ago in another talk that I was looking for. And so maybe this. Try to go out and come back. Yeah, that might do it. Yeah, let me, let me try this. But oh, come on, I cannot. I'm, Yeah, do you want do you want to try um, exiting and then uh, and then and then coming back into the call? Or I can forcibly stop the sh this the screen share. Mateus, are you hearing us? Okay. Um, Mateus? Okay, this is not going very well. So I can remove <laughs> him. I, I will just remove him manually. I believe that will do it and he can just log in afterwards. But yeah, let me do this. Uh, okay, so if I remove him right now, he will not be able to join us back again, apparently. Oh. Yes, so that's bad. Let me stop the share with that. Yes. Let me... So I don't know what happened, but I just Googled this kind of problems. And apparently this also happens with, I don't know, three or four guests. So sometimes you just have bad luck. So it's not uh, to the number of participants. Unfortunately, I also don't know what could have caused this. Yeah. Okay, yes. There's a Just... suggestion in the chat. Maybe someone yes. else can share the slides and Mateus could still speak. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking into that, but we also uh, we also like so, don't even hear him right now. Can you see me again? Yes. We can see you again. Yes. Okay. 
So that Welcome was, back. That was, that was nice. I had to change. I don't know what the, what just happened. I, I had to change my my tablet. So okay. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can share. Yes, please. Whatever is here. Uh, if not, then yeah. Potentially, what we can do is we can all switch over to one of us sharing the slides. Aha. Uh -huh. Just one moment. Let me see if I can share. Wait. I'm trying to find it. Would you like Would you like me to share the slides and then I can you can just tell me when to hit for the next slide? Yeah, but the thing is, the version I the version I sent to you guys there there was no pause because I thought it would be a good idea. Let me. <laughs> there was no what. There was no pauses, but well, it's it's not a problem. Okay, so if you could share the slides, that would be great. Okay. Okay, Ryan. Uh, just a moment. Let me get them up. I just just got them down. So let's see. So I made the slides up, and now I'll do a screen share. Do -do 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 -do. Uh, no sound effect, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. All right. I believe what you were here. Yes, we were here. And would you start the other recording goes on? Okay. Thank you very much. So please, Matthews. Just say next when you want me to hit the next slide. Well, the next he's... one. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so can go to the next slide. Uh, okay, guys, that was that was embarrassing, but well, let's move on. Uh, okay. So again, so you have the the Conan Elkis Gorbachev bounds. I just want to remark the following. Uh, so, okay, so the proof of that is, is, is sort of just looking at Poisson summation. And if you want to solve the sphere packing problem in a certain dimension, uh, and you, by some chance, you wish the solution to be a lattice packing, and you, you want to use the bound I just showed you, if you look through the proof, uh, if you want to find the extremal radius, the, the, the smallest radius you can, you, can, you can pick, you have to look for functions which are radial, first of all, because Whenever you find a function that satisfies the extremal radius, uh, radius over, uh, of the Gorbachev Conan Elkins uh, bound, you can radialize it and it will satisfy the same properties with at least the same radius. So you, we can look for radial functions always. And the, the function that will, will give you the best possible bound is one that has to be zero over the lattice, except for the origin, where it has to be one. And if your lattice is self dual, let's say, which are the all the examples I know have this property in a way, uh, then that its Fourier transform has to be zero also over the, the, this lattice, except for the, for the origin. And so you sort of have a problem when you want to find a function that is zero over your candidate lattice, except for the origin. Its Fourier transform also has a similar property, uh, but you, wanna, you, wanna, you want the function to, to have a certain sign change, okay? And so this is a sort of an interpolation problem you want to solve. And if, if, if by some chance you, your, the solution to your problem is unique, it has to satisfy these properties. So one, one way to look into this would be to prove that there is a unique given values over a certain lattice, or in this case, over a certain radius, because if you think about radio functions, uh, then, and you give also values of your Fourier transform, you would hope that it's uniquely determined by that information, okay? So, you know, seen in a nutshell. And also, another way of thinking of this uh, Conan Elkins Gorbachev uh, bounds is in the opposite direction. So, you give me a function and you want to minimize the radius I, I introduce it. 
But since you know that the, the volume of the ball of radius R over two has to be bigger than any sphere packing density, so this gives you a lower bound for the radius, right? So this means that uh, the, 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 this, given this class of functions, you have, you have a lower bound for the radius. So you cannot localize it, uh, this radius very close to the origin. So you can think of this as an uncertainty principle as well. Uh, it's, I think most people are calling these, this kind of thing now a uh, sign uncertainty principles because you have, you have some sign change for your Fourier transform. You have this property and you, wanna you, wanna, you want to understand where, what is the smallest uh, possible size of the last sign change uh, for the Fourier transform of a function assuming certain center conditions on the function. Uh, so next slide. So more precisely, this is what I mean. So I'm going to call this plus and minus one sign uncertainty principle. And this, so these are two different uncertainty principles, okay? But I, I just plugged in here. So what I just introduced to you, uh, the Scone and Elkins Gorbachev uh, theorem, you can think of this as the minus one sign uncertainty principle. And by that, I mean that there is a, a hole a, a, that depends on the dimension. Uh, which is going to be the smallest radius, such that if you give me a, a Schwartz function and a positive, a positive radius such that uh, f of, of 0 and f hat of 0 are 1, f of x is non-negative, and oh, here, here I put the minus 1 or plus 1 in multiplying by f hat, okay? So this means it's either non-negative or non-positive eventually, okay? And if I want, if I want to calculate the last sign change, uh, there is a hole, uh, as like, as a small radius that depends on the dimension, such that this last sign change has to be bigger than that, than that uh, universal uh, number. I mean, not, not universal, depends on the on dimension, okay? Uh, so there should be a modulus of u bigger than r here, but well, first typo. So in 2017, uh, Henry Cohn and Felipe Gonçalves, they, they introduced these uh, plus and minus one sign and principles in a, like they connected them because this, this uh, you can think of the minus one sign uncertainty principle as the Kohn and Elkins uh, uh, result. And the plus, the plus one uncertainty principle was actually introduced by Burgan, Closel, and Kahan uh, to deal with totally different problems. They were not concerned with sphere packing. But surprisingly, uh, no, or perhaps not so surprisingly, uh, so Kohn and Gonsalves found this connection that asymptotically, uh, these two limits, a d of plus one and over square root of d, and a d of minus one over square root of d. Uh, these two limits exist and they are equal. So this, this, both these uncertainty principles in the limit, they sort of resemble one another. And uh, very interestingly, uh, they, they solved this problem. They found that what is the smallest possible radius in the, the biggest possible whole d, if you think, or the smallest possible r uh, for dimension 12 for the plus one uncertainty principle. So remember the plus one is, is, is the, the one that by Borgang, Kulun, Zell, Kahan, and the minus one is the Conan Elkins uh, principle. Uh, so there's this interesting work that came out like a month ago uh, by Emmanuel Carneiro and, and Oscar Quesada, where they introduced uh, new uncertainty principles related to this. So instead of a plus minus one here, you can think of, you can put a function if you wish. And now instead of like having the last sign change, what you want is that you, you wanna have your function uh, in a way with its sign resonating with a certain, uh, with a certain, uh, with the sign of the function, with a function p, okay? Uh, nice, but uh, there is this very interesting property that they, they prove in the paper, that there is a mechanism that if you produce, if you actually calculate uh, one of the sharp uh, values of, uh, involved in the sign certain principles for a certain dimension, they have a trick which you can kind of jump four dimensions, okay? So this A12 here uh, is no coincidence. Uh, was, I mean, at the time, at the time it, it, uh, Conan and Gonçalves, they saw this connection, but I don't think they actually could precise it in the way that uh, Carnero and Casada did. But this 12 should come from the dimension eight uh, that is involved in the sphere packing uh, problem that was solved by Jasovska. So uh, next slide. Just a moment, please. Uh, so in the chat, we have now a message by Felipe Gonzalez, and he said he did not prove item two, so I'm not quite sure what he means by this. Ah, perhaps he means that this was proven before, but this is in the paper. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Yes. Is that correct, Felipe? 
I don't know if he's listening anymore, but well. Uh, okay, so, so in 2016, there was this major breakthrough on, the, on this fear packing front. Ah, okay, so this is, okay, I thought you had proof of this already. Okay, so Felipe has mentioned that this is conjecture. Okay, so my mistake. Uh, okay, so perhaps we can discuss this after the talk. But anyway, so moving on, so there is, so, but the A12, the A12 uh, value that he calculated for the plus one sign uncertainty principle uh, actually coincides with what you should get, should, which you get for the A8 minus one uncertainty principle. It's so exactly the same value as the square root of two. And this was how Vyasovska uh, solved the sphere packing problem in dimension eight. The, she constructed a function that satisfies these this properties. Zero, it's one on zero. This Fourier transform is one on zero. And it's sign, it, it, it becomes non-positive after square, it's Fourier transform becomes non-positive after square root of two. And because of the, the numerology involved in this, this means that the DH lattice, which was the conjecture uh, uh, candidate to solve this problem, actually solves it because if you plug it, the density you get from the EH lattice, you're gonna get exactly the same one from the Conan Elkins bound. And one week later, I think it was one week later, uh, they solved the problem for dimension 24. And uh, this, in other words, they also, they did the same thing. They exhibit a function, satisfy these properties, uh, which in particular means that the A24 minus one sine, uh, sine uncertainty principle is equal to one which is the, the radius of the last sign change for this, for this function. Okay, so again, uh, there's this, you see this plus four from the A8 to A12, they, exact, they have the exactly same value. And now if this uh, theorem by Carnero and Casada, you, you, we can, there's a more clear connection uh, going on between these, these two numbers. Uh, and this is an, inter this is an interesting uh, area of research that is very active right now. So whoever is interested in this, is, there's a lot of things to think about. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Okay, so as I mentioned to you, uh, in order to, to build these, uh, these functions that optimize your, that will provide you your, your optimal radius, uh, there was a bunch of interpolation problems that they wished to prove uh, that were that uniquely determined a, a, a group of functions. Okay, so a year later, after they proved this, uh, uh, this this is free packing conjectures for dimension eight and twenty-four, uh, the Nuru Hachenko and Marina Gazovska uh, produced this theorem here, the, the the first one, which is which is the following. So they proved that there is a sequence of functions a n. Uh, all these functions are Schwartz such that if you give me an even function uh, from R to C that is, belongs to the Schwarz class, you have the following identity. So you can determine F as a combination of A n and the Fourier transform of A n. And the coefficients you are multiplying here is just the, the value of F over the square root of the integers and the value of the Fourier transform of F over the square root of the integers. And this, this, this hypothesis of, of being an even function is necessary because if you don't put this, uh, uh, you, you need another degree of, uh, you, need, you need another information. So there is this, if you drop the even function uh, hypothesis, you can produce a, a space of dimension one of functions that satisfies this, that have the same value as f over the square root of the integers. And I should mention that this convergence here is uh, holds uniformly. Uh, so just so small this question. Is not a, okay. So, sorry, the, this, uh, the index of the AN should be AK, right? Oh yeah, you are completely right. Okay. Uh, uh, any more question? Okay, so let's move on. Uh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> just to the next theorem, not the next slide. Uh, okay, but if the, but the lattice is, that you need to deal with to solve the sphere packing problems, uh, the values of the functions, uh, so the size of the points of the lattice are not, they are of the form square root of an integer, but they don't cover all the square roots of the integers. They, in fact, they are even lattices. So they are only gonna cover the square root of, of the even integers in a way. 
So this, this is not exactly the problem, the kind of problem you need to solve in order to find a, an extremal function for, the, for your sign uncertainty, if you think about it, or the sphere packing problems, if you wish, depending on your dimension. Uh, so you need to find an interpolation formula that would cover the, the square root of the even integers. But imagine that this was true in dimension one, for instance, that you could, uh, uh, but, but because of this interpolation formula I just gave you, this is impossible because I can just construct a function that is, has the value I wish uh, outside of the square root of the integers, of the even integers, because I can just move around this interpolation formula. So if I, if I just want to work with half the information, I need to add some extra, some extra data. And this comes from the derivatives of the functions, okay? So remember, uh, the functions that you need to deal in the, to, to solve the, to get the sharp bounds in the uncertainty principles of the sphere packing, they, they, are, they have to be zero over the lattice, as I mentioned in the beginning. So this, and since they have like a sign, they are either positive or non-negative eventually, when they touch the lattice, they're gonna have a double zero because they are, they are gonna touch the lattice and then come down or come up depending on which side you come from. So this gives you an extra information about the derivative. So it has to be, the derivative has to be zero as well. So the kind of result they were actually looking for is the second one which they proved in 2019 in this uh, very beautiful paper, where they, they also prove optimality and universality of, of the lattices that solve these problems. And uh, so they, they also come up with these nice formulas. So uh, what, they, what they prove is the following. So there are functions, an and bn, which are Schwartz functions, such that every radio function can be uniquely recovered by these values, okay? the f of square root of 2n, f prime of square root of 2n, and, and the same thing for the Fourier transform. And you need, there is a difference between dimension eight and 24. And this difference comes, at, I mean, this dimensional difference is still kind of a mystery to me. I know, I know why this, in this particular case, because of the sphere packing problem, because you have the lattices that solve the problem, then you have to look for the, for the minimum non zero point of the lattice, and you look the size of them. And in the Leach lattice, it starts at, uh, uh, at two, and in the EH lattice, it starts at, at, at one, a square root of two. So this is why you, ha you have a different N zero in this formula. Uh, but I don't have a guess of what would happen in different dimensions if you had a theorem like this, or at least, at least a complete guess. So as you can see, there is a, in dimension eight, the N zero should be one, so you need, you need to sample the function starting from square root of two, and in dimension 24, the n0 is, is two, so you have to start sampling from two. Uh, but in either way, you get this nice formula, okay? And now the, I think the n's are, are matching. Um, it's not k and n. Uh, okay, so go ahead. All right, so wait, so the functions a n and b n, their inputs are coming from the real numbers, but the inputs of f are coming from r d or Am I f is radio. So, but but what is but what is the input of, of f here? Is it is it the um, is it the radius itself? So, like the norm of a point in R D, or is it the point in R D? Oh no, it's the point. No, f is a radio function. Okay, so you can, so, you can think of it as one dimensional. So you are just you are measuring what is the value of f on the on the radius square root of two n over that right. sphere. So a n and b n should 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 indeed in in Swartz r d not Swartz r right? Yes. Oh, okay. Probably. Thanks. Probably. You are right. Uh, sure. So, yes, you are right. There is a d missing over there. Uh, okay. Did did I answer your question? Yes. Thank oh, you. But yeah. Also, also if the the nice observation. Okay. So, uh, in a nutshell, what what is stated in this slide ah. is that we have two we have two formulas. One that one that uh, you can recover a function in a certain dimension just by knowing its values of the square root of the integers, and another one for radio functions in dimension eight and twenty four, which you can recover the functions uh, by knowing the values of the function ah. over the square root of two times an integer, and their derivatives and their Fourier transform and the derivatives of the Fourier transform. And I should mention that this this, this first theorem, sorry. Uh, a and B are, are in SR only because only radius is mattering. 
Uh, sorry, uh, sorry uh, the, 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 the audio is, is not right. that good. The functions A and B N are in SR because only radius is mattering. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, they are, they are radio as well. Uh, uh, so it is, it is fine as it is, it is fine. Uh, in, in a way, but uh, uh, so they, should be, uh, they should be radio in RD if you wish, it's, it would be more precise. Uh -huh. Yeah, but so okay. we, I don't need uh, on RD. I, it's enough to know them on R. Uh, yes, you just need to know what happens over the uh, the ah, radius. So, so SR is fine. Okay. Uh, I should mention that there ha there has a generalization of the first theorem by Martin Stoller, which I believe is in the audience, or at least was. I don't know what happened when when my when I had technical issues. Uh, so he generalized this to, to other dimensions and instead of but now you need you need information over spheres so you can kind of, you can recover the function if you know all the values of the functions over certain spheres spheres of radius the square root of an integer and in case the functions are radial that again returns you a theorem like like the first one uh it's actually a very nice theorem it came out last year i think uh, perhaps you can we can ask Martin after this this talk is over. Uh, but okay, so so I hope you from you get from this is that there is an inter, there are interpolation formulas that don't have derivatives and there are some that have derivatives. That's that's the that's what you should get from this slide. So uh, next one. Uh, so since this is when you look at this uh, these two theorems, you perhaps you not see a connection, uh, but uh, they are. They have some. There is like some meta meta connections between these uh, these results. So this the first one is the Shannon Whitaker interpolation theorem. It, I think it was not proven. It was proven neither by Shannon nor Whitaker, but it comes from it comes from the, the 19th century. Uh, so if you give me a function, which is in L2, and whose Fourier transform is supported on the interval minus one half one half, then uh, you can represent the function as these uh, combinations of cardinal signs just by knowing its values over the integers. And, and down, you have this, uh, this other theorem, which is by, by Jeff Fowler from 1985, which is if you have a function whose Fourier transform is now supported in minus one one, then I can recover the function uh, by using this uh, nice sine square over sine of x square translated or divided by x not uh, without the square. And just by knowing the values of the functions over the integers and the values of the derivatives over the integers. Uh, so in the second, in the first theorem, okay, if I replace it minus one half, one half for minus one, one, I could get a representation like this, but instead of the integers, I would get the integers over two. Because it's kind of, if you have double the domain, you need, you need double the information. And the sec what the th second theorem is telling you is that, okay, I can change half of this information by the information of the derivative. So you can, you can sort of see a analogy between what was happening before, or I hope so. Uh, so that of, as I mentioned, there is no real connection like saying that a theorem like this implies something uh, about the other interpolation formulas you saw, but I, I like to think of these results as as kind of inspiration when, when trying to find the right uh, scale or the right kind of theorem I'm looking for in the, when you look at the square root of integer cases. Okay, so next, next slide. So now there are uh, three questions I wanna, I wanna raise. So I f we find out this connection, we found out this connection uh, uh, in this last paper that you can actually get the Valor interpolation theorem. I mean, the one with derivatives from the one without derivatives, okay? Uh, so it's actually, it's not that hard actually. Uh, I was actually surprised because I didn't, found, I didn't find this anywhere, uh, but perhaps this wasn't known before, but anyway, it's, it's in, the, in the 2020 paper if you wish to know the proof. And uh, this raises the question like, can you come from an interpolation formula without derivatives to, to one that has derivatives? So, so I have been looking for this for a while. Uh, so far, <laughs> no success. Uh, but uh, some other stuff can be asked as well. So 
all these all these formulas and, and problems that I stated up to now, they have this uh, nice square root of integer uh, structure going on. And if you know the papers where these things are proven, you 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 know that there is like some modular form magic going on. And but sometimes you you want an interpolation formula that is more flexible, in a way. So I. I asked this question a, a couple of years ago, and I think I, I think I talked with most of the people who were involved in, in this in these endeavors, and I wanted to know if there was like perturbations of these formulas. Okay, so here is interpolation admits perturbation, not interpolation. Okay, and what I wanted to know, so if I can move the nodes of interpolation a little, so uh, so if I can perturb them. So just so you know, the shannon wittke theorem it has a perturbation version. Which is called the Kadach uh, one fourth theorem, uh, that tells you that if you can move the integers to something that is close to the integers by one fourth, so you can get every integer and in, in, in like k, and you can sum some some epsilon k, as long as epsilon k is smaller than one fourth one one quarter, and then then you are you are fine. You still have an interpolation result. And the same more or less the same thing can be said uh, about Valle's theorem. It also admits perturbations. And this, this raises the question if the Kuhn, Kumar, Miller, Hachenko, Vyazovsky interpolation also admits uh, some sort of perturbation. Uh, so this is, the, this is the, the content of, of my paper with João. So you can move on. So what we proved was the following. So let's, let's read this carefully. So Basically, the theorem one, the, the first one, tells you that there are interpolation formulas uh, which you can recover a function by knowing its values over a set of points of this form, j plus epsilon j. Uh, and this epsilon j goes to zero when j goes to infinity, and the rate at which it goes to zero is polynomial. In this particular case, the best we could get was this: that epsilon, k goes, epsilon j goes to zero as k over k minus five-fourths. And of, but you have to assume that epsilon zero is equal to zero, okay? So you can perturb all the points of in the, the interpolation theorem of Hachenko and Vyazovska, except for the origin. It has to stay still. Uh, I'm gonna mention why in a moment. Uh, the, there's one, one technical issue is that if you, if you want to have these, uh, these perturbations uh, in a polynomial way, Unfortunately, the interpolation functions you get only have polynomial decay, and their Fourier transform have polynomial decay. So they, they are not exactly uh, Schwartz functions. Uh, but if you, assume, if you assume like smaller perturbations, for instance, exponentially decaying perturbations, or something that is super polynomial, then you can prove that these, these functions are, are of Schwartz class, okay? But the bottom line is you can recover a function uh, by just by knowing its values over these nodes of interpolation. And one of the key ingredients of, to prove this was actually to get better bounds for the, oops, I think you, I think you went ahead one slide. Okay, so which is this, this second theorem. So the, the key to prove this was to get better bounds for the interpolation basis of the hachenko vyazovska theorem. So if you consider the, the Fourier invariant part of the, the interpolation basis and the Fourier, the Fourier untie invariant part of the, of the interpolation basis, we managed to prove these bounds, that there is a universal C such that this decays like some polynomial thing uh, on N uh, times e to the minus C mod X divided by square root of N. And same thing for the first derivative. Uh, this is, I mean, I think it just was a week before we, we, we posted this on archive. Uh, Bondarenko, Saip, and Hachenko, they, they, they introduced this one, this one paper where they do, uh, they, they, they introduce some new interpolation formulas involving zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And they also, they, they get some new bounds over there. And there is this, this N one quarter and N three, three quarters also appear in their paper, but they don't calculate the decay of the functions of the, uh, that are involved over there. And so, this was, this was kind of the new, the new feature of this paper. And this was very important. I'm gonna tell you why in a moment. So next slide. 
And also, uh, just uh, very shortly, we can get the same thing uh, for the formulas with, with uh, derivatives, okay? So exactly the same theorems. You can determine the function by knowing its values over, over perturbations of square root of 2n, uh, because remember, this is over the even integers. And in order to prove that, we need to prove some bounds for the interpolation basis. So the, the, the proofs of both these theorems are, ki are kind of similar. And they all rely on these uh, improved uh, bounds for the interpolation basis. And one, one very simple idea. So you can move on to the next slide. So, so the idea of the proof is the following. So you look at these equations you have here, okay? So imagine you have a, a small epsilon k, okay? So you have the, you have the original interpolation formula. Uh, so if you wanna calculate f of square root of k plus epsilon k, you can use the interpolation formula and you get these uh, two lines of, of equations, okay? And so if you want to, if, if you could, you can, you can see this as an inf, uh, infinite dimensional system, like a linear system that you want to solve. I just wanna, I have this, I have this, uh, I have this infinite dimensional system involving fn and f, f hat of, f of square root of n and f hat of square root of n. And I want to recover these numbers because if I know them, I can just plug them in the interpolation formula and, and, and recover the function, right? So the, uh, the idea we followed is, okay, so we just want to invert an operator. But remember, these functions a n, they all have the property that they are zero over, over all the square root of the integers except for the square root of n. So this a n of square root of k, is, is, is a delta of nk. So, so if I, it's, it's sort of the identity on the diagonal. So if I want to invert an operator like this, uh, I can subtract the identity and prove that it, it has a very small norm. So in, in a way, I just want to prove it's a, it's a perturbation of the identity. And so this leads naturally to consider the following operator in the, the, in the other line, in this space of uh, L2 sequences which is ex it's exactly what I'm doing above, but I'm just subtracting the identity on the diagonal. And you have to prove that if this guy has a small norm, then you can invert the operator, uh, the original operator you wanted to invert and solve the system on the, uh, on, the line, on the set of equations before, and then just plug this information on, on, the, on the original interpolation formula you had, and then you recover a new interpolation formula. So very simple idea, it's just, it's just functional analysis. The problem is proving that this operator has a small norm, okay? And that, that's why the bounds that we introduced in the, in the other slide, and that's also why you need epsilon k to the k. Uh, so at this, it should, it should be, I mean, I suspect that you can do better things here and by using all the like, better constellation properties than what we did, but this already uh, proves you that if you know how the a ends decay and the a hat of n decay, then you can, you can get something. So you can get a small perturbation. Okay. Uh, so moving on. So all these, all these questions were about like recovering a function, right? But you could ask something weaker. Instead of trying to recover a function, you could ask, you, you could ask yourself, okay, so, what kind of conditions I can put on a set, uh, on two sets, A and A hat, such that if I know that a function is zero on one set and its Fourier transform is zero on the other set, then the function is zero. So I gave you some examples of, of interpolation formulas and the interpolation nodes that, uh, that I, I introduced, they, they satisfy this property. Whenever a function is zero over the interpolation nodes and its Fourier transform is zero over the interpolation nodes, then the function is zero. Or if you want, there is a unique function with, with those values. So it's a uniqueness property. And with that, that in mind, I define this, this notion of uniqueness pair. So I'm just gonna call two sets A and A hat, a uniqueness pair, uh, if, if the only function that vanishes on the set A and its Fourier transform vanishes on the set A hat is the zero function, okay? And based on what we, we saw, we can think of several, uh, uh, uniqueness pairs, right? We had the interpolation basis, and also I, I talked about you. Uh, 
I talked with you about the Shannon interpolation theorem. And it, it's a slightly different flavor, but it tells you that the set, the set of the integers and, and the set of R minus, minus one half, one half forms a uniqueness pair. So if a function vanishes outside of minus one half, one half, and its Fourier transform vanishes on the integers, then the function is zero. Uh, or you can change the, 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 the role of the Fourier transform in the function here. So uh, this raises the, a question for us when we started looking into this. So we know the square root of n provides you a, a interpolation basis, uh, and therefore it, it gives you a uniqueness pair, but it leaves the, the question that what happens if you get a more concentrated sequence? So instead of looking at square root of n, you look like, you know, n to a certain power, a uh, very small power, so it concentrates, very, it concentrates more at infinity. And you wanted to know if a function is zero on, on, that, on that sequence and its Fourier transform is zero in a different sequence, can you say something? Can you prove that this function is zero? And uh, this is the content of the next slide. Uh, so, so in 2019, we proved the following theorem. So if you give me two numbers, alpha and beta, uh, between zero and one, and a Schwartz function, then uh, if, if the function vanishes, on log of n, and its Fourier transform vanishes on n to the alpha for every natural number, then f is zero. Okay, this means that the, the set of logs of, of the integer numbers and the set of powers of plus minus the n to alpha, they, they, this forms a uniqueness pair uh, for the Schwarz class. Okay, and we, what we wanted originally to do was to to prove this for every alpha and beta such that alpha plus beta is equal to, is, is, is smaller than one. So you have this, this, uh, this picture here of a square of size one of, 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 of uh, and you have the diagonal, which is alpha plus beta equal to one. And we managed to prove that there is a set A. The set A is the one in, in, in sort of, it's bluish purple color. And we proved that if alpha beta belongs to A, then, uh, and if f vanishes on plus minus n to the alpha and its Fourier transform vanishes on f on plus minus n to the beta, then f has to be zero. So I, I, I'm not gonna bother you with what's the definition of the set A, because I'm sure you're gonna forget it after this talk. What, what, it, what you have to remember is that it's not the whole lower triangle. Uh, so we finished this paper and we left this, we left this problem of, okay, so can we, actually, can we actually fill this whole lower triangle? And uh, f like a f month ago or something, or like Nazarov and Sojin announced it, that they actually solved this problem and they, they proved that you can, you can feel the lower triangle. And they even proved that if you go to the upper triangle, there is always a function that vanishes on, on, on the sequences like this and is not zero. But this, this is not published yet. And this is, so far it's only oral communication. So I'm gonna mention here in video, but I'm not gonna leave it on the slides. Uh, so we can move on. So let me give you an idea on how do you prove something like this, okay? So uh, we don't have an interpolation formula. So how do you prove that a function will vanish given a certain, given that it vanishes on certain uh, sequence of points? So the first, the first idea is you, you have to use these zeros to obtain decay for the function. So I claim to you that you have, a, you have this strange bound here. Uh, which you don't have to remember so, so much. It has a bunch of coefficients, but what you have to remember is the last line. So, uh, so f of x is smaller than x to alpha minus one over alpha to k, multiplied by k for any k. But so this function, if you have a function that is zero over this, uh, over n to the alpha, then you can obtain a polynomial decay with explicit coefficients, okay? Of course, it had polynomial decay because it's a Schwartz function, but uh, what, I, what I want here is some control on the coefficients. And you can say the same thing about the, its Fourier transform. Uh, and this, so okay, so there is, a, there is a number, there are some numbers here, beta, alpha, j, blah, 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 on the coefficients, and there is some strange ik of f and ik of f hat. And these numbers are just the integrals of, of, of a function times a, a power weight, okay? So how do you get a bound like this? It's, it's pretty simple. So the idea is that if a function vanishes 
on a sequence, then its derivative vanishes on a sequence that is inter that is bit that has that like interchanges uh, this other sequence. So if you have a sequence of zeros of the function between two zeros of the function, you have a zero of the derivative. As long as the function is real, okay. So there is a reduction you have to do to assume the function is real, but uh, and then you keep repeating this process. So whenever you have two zeros of the the first derivative, between them there is a zero of the second derivative, and then you keep doing this, and you keep producing zeros for all the derivatives of the function, and now you just you fix a point, and then you just compare it to the closest zero uh, of the derivative you have. So for instance, you have this f. F, uh, the kth derivative of f on the point x is equal to the to the difference of these minus the minus f of a m k, where this a m k is just the oh there is a, there is a, a k missing. This should be the, the kth derivative. So I'm just I'm just subtracting zero, okay? But if I use Fourier inversion, I can get this nice formula here uh, with a difference of two exponentials, and then I get a new bound. That depends on the distance of two consecutive zeros of the of the, the kth derivative. And then it's just a question of using of, of iterating this process so you can get explicit bounds as the first ones I said. So the, the first idea is this one. So if you have a function that vanishes several times, it, it has a certain decay. Okay, it decay is going to depend on alpha and beta. So next slide. Uh, so the sec but remember there was this ik of f. On the uh, amongst the constants, the constants that are multiplying the polynomial decay, and the second step is you can you have to get some some bounds for i k of f, and you can actually you can just you can just plug one bound inside the other, optimize on on like checking things inside the ball outside the ball, and you can prove a bound like this. You can prove that i k of f is smaller than a certain function g k plus a function h k multiplied by another i k which I'm going to call ik star of the same function. And if alpha plus beta is smaller than one, then this k star is, is something which is smaller than k. Okay, it's, it's of the order of lambda k, of, sorry, gamma k, where gamma is this number. It's alpha over one minus alpha and beta over one minus beta. So this, this gamma is only smaller than one if, if alpha and beta are both smaller than one. Uh, sorry, if the sum of alpha and beta is smaller than one. This is equivalent to, to that condition. So, so once you have this bound, the idea is, okay, so you just repeat this process, right? Until you go to a k star, which is, I don't know, smaller than 10, let's say. So then you get a precise decay for, the, for these integrals ik. And once you have that, uh, it's just a question of examining what alphas and, and betas you are playing with. So in order to get a decay for f itself. Uh, so I'm skipping a bunch of things here, but in the end, by using what, using this, this inequality, you can prove that f of x will decay like exponentially uh, with, so, with a certain power a that depends on, on alpha and beta. So now, if alpha is, is, is big enough, you can prove, it's, it's, if it's bigger than one, you can prove that the, the Fourier transform of f uh, can be extended to the full whole complex plane. Remember, this is a real function, okay? But if, if the Fourier transform has exponential decay, you can prove that it, it is, uh, if the function has exponential decay, its Fourier transform is gonna, is gonna be analytic. And it's gonna, have a, uh, it's gonna be an analytic function of finite order. More precisely, it's gonna be of order alpha over a over a minus one. Okay, by that I mean the following inequality. So f hat of z is loses to this exponential. So, so we all remember from our complex analysis course, that if a function has this, this sort of uh, growth, it cannot have zeros that accumulate too much. So now it's a question of analyzing uh, your conditions on alpha and beta and what A you can actually get in order to get the region that we described in the theorem. So if, if your zeros accumulate more than what is, is allowed by this order of growth, then your function has to be zero. So that, that's where our region comes from. Uh, so I should mention that as I already told you, so Nazarov and Sojin actually completely solved this question, and and they, they their techniques are somewhat similar to what we did. They actually men they mentioned this to us, but in a much much smarter way, let's say. 
Uh, so they did a much uh, they did a much more uh, convoluted analysis of all these things, and and they because I have a lot of pointwise information going on here, and one of the first steps that that they implement in their ideas is they actually get information in average. So this this allows for more flexibility. Uh, but but okay, but so. Uh, as far as theorems goes, this is what I wanted to talk to you today. So I will just leave you guys with a few questions. So next slide. So I, so I was going to I was going to put here some uniqueness questions when I first started to think about this talk, but between the time I I, I proposed it to give the talk and the, and today, so the questions I, I had were solved, so they are not here. But as far as the, uh, let's let's look again at the perturbations things. Uh, so I told you that you can recover the function if you know its values over square root of k plus some epsilon k. It should be it should be true. Uh, at least that's there are some evidence coming from these uh, quasi-crystalline measures that you should be able to do like uniform perturbations. So there should be a, a number theta such that you can perturb around every point by by a small a small theta. Okay, so it should, you should, it should be some sequence like this, so f of zero, f of square root of one plus epsilon one, two plus epsilon two, where these epsilons are, are small, but they don't necessarily decay when you go to infinity. And of course, the same information for the Fourier transform. So this would be amazing, an amazing result in my opinion. But one which would be very nice already is if you prove that you can do this uh, with epsilon decaying like, like polynomially, but with a small coefficient. It should be epsilon k here, not epsilon i. Uh, so I call this like the maximum perturbation conjecture in, in, in its weak form. So if whoever is interested in talking about this, uh, uh, so there are these two nice questions uh, and I'm looking for other ideas to extend what, uh, what has already been done. Uh, there, are some, there are some other sequences that have been, other interpolation sequences that have been, been produced. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Daniel Hachenko has stated in some talk uh, that he can do this. You, if you choose epsilon k to be constant, uh, epsilon k equal to some epsilon, a very small one, then this is true. But it's a, it's a uniform translation, okay? So if, if you do an uniform translation, then, then the, the result is true, but this is not written, so, uh, and I don't know when it's gonna come, so I'm, I'm not gonna go too much into detail because I already have said that something was a theorem and it was in the conjecture today, so let's not risk that again. Okay, so uh, so give you guys some some interpolation formulas, some uh, theorems, and some actions with packing problems. And I left you guys with some questions to solve. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I'm sorry again for the <laughs> for the technical issue, which I figured out what happened. And thank you for the for the opportunity to be here. And that's it. Thank you very much, Mateus. Thank you. Let's applaud perhaps our guests. I'll press the applause button. <laughs> so this is now the time for questions. Please be aware that we are still recording, and if you don't. If you don't mind being recorded, just ask right now or just wait till we quit, uh, quit, quit recording. So questions, please. Okay. Sorry, my internet cut out. <laughs> okay, no problem. Should I put the screen share back on? Yeah, no, oh, no, no fine. problem. Just that, that door was only on one slide saying thank you. So that was okay. Do we already applaud? Yes, we did this oh, already. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I guess I guess no one has questions. Or uh, perhaps uh, some people left in the middle after after the the whole shenanigan with the, the frozen screen. I have a question, but these kids are so stupid. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any idea about how this, your, your functions of f of k in this last question, how do you, in your theorem, sorry, how do you feel the zero one uh, interval? 
they could accumulate a lot uh, around zero, but they, they, um, they could approach in some sense uh, up to one half or uh, they are far Hello? from one for sure. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Lucas, I'm not listening. Uh, sorry, there is like some some noise. No, I have a question. Uh, I have a question. In the slide before, uh, you had a. Excuse so me, small... uh, I believe Lucas Oliveira was uh, asking a question. Would you please be patient enough? So please, Lucas Oliveira, uh, you have been talking about accumulation of zeros, I believe. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, well, we hear you, you so... but. There's a cracking sound. Just be aware of this. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, wait a moment. Please uh, ask another question. I hope I hope pick up my, my phones here. Just a moment. Okay, sure. So, madam, please. Ha. You have uh, the slide before. You had A, you know, E raised to something with mod X raised to A. The slide uh, before this one? Uh, one slide before the last slide. This one? Okay, this one? Ah, this one, yes. So, this A, smaller A's will work once A works. So you have to say maximum of the uh, A's that work because in the next one you have A over A minus one. So your A no, has so to be bigger than yeah. one or something, is it? Yes, A has to be bigger than one. So, uh -huh. for, uh, so, this, so for, this, for this to work, you need, you need, you need a alpha and beta a, to, be to be bigger than that one. Region. Uh -huh. So uh, we have to say in three that it is the largest possible A that we consider because the smaller A, A's will work if one A you have found, smaller A's will work just fine. Uh, yes, so, so you, you have the bigger the A, the better because then you, so if, yes. if, if, if you could get A to be as close to infinity as possible, then this would be, this yes, would be perfect. Yes, yes. yes, yes, uh, yes. So, but, but yeah, but the best A you can get here will depend on the choice of alpha and beta. Yes. And so it's, 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 this A comes from a, a... Uh, so it's better to say in uh, your condition uh, uh, two that uh, we will choose a largest possible A here. Oh, okay. No, so, so ah, this was, uh, okay. Uh, so I think, I think I mentioned that A had to be bigger than one, but uh, uh, sorry, my, my sorry, they didn't put it in the slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, this is all right, no? what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No, no uh, very, thank you talk. very interesting talk. Very interesting talk. Next question, okay. please. Okay, can you hear me better now, Matheus? Yes, there is no cracking noise anymore. Okay, now I was cooking here. Oh, uh, anyway, um, the question is this. Uh, do you have an idea about how this this these perturbations that you that you have how they distribute between zero and one? Because, for example, you plug some decay, so for sure you cannot go with this epsilon as close as one as we want. But do you know how far you can? Oh no! Ah, you mean like you want you want a explicit number? Yes. For example, how ah, much yeah, you can so... feel from from the interval from zero to one because. Yeah. Okay. So in principle, you can you can get an explicit number, but yep. it, it would it would have increased our calculations by a large margin. So we decided not to pursue this direction. The problem is that uh, so when you when you when you are bounding the the, the interpolation basis, uh, the original uh, you 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 look into mod you look into the model of forms that are used to define them. And what we did to get the better bounds was basically look, look to the proof of, of uh, Daniel and Marina and see where they missed something. I mean, not, not, not that they missed something, but sometimes they, they, they want to prove something and they don't, they don't bother uh, actually getting the, the best possible bounds on that, on that one line because that was not the goal of the paper itself. So, but sometimes, sometimes you can see from the formulas that you can get some better decay, but it, it, it involves a large amount of work uh, but sometimes you sometimes unfortunately you get some constant which is implicit and I and you, I would have to look into the into the theorems itself to and how to get these constants is like you have to estimate some integrals perhaps numerically to get it and then then you I could get precise bounds but I didn't I we didn't pursue this direction uh, okay so, so if your question is if you have an explicit number like how close to one they have to be and then the answer is, I don't know. 
Uh, it can be calculated in principle, but I didn't do it. Okay, perfect. Uh, we can we can also talk about this later. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Another question, please. I'll end the recording here.